Welcome to one of the internet's best podcasts, where we dive deep into the lives of the extraordinary and fascinating people who leave an indelible mark on our world. Join us as we explore their captivating stories, remarkable achievements, and unique perspectives that shape history and inspire generations. Get ready to embark on a journey through the lives of inspiring people unlike any other. Good morning and welcome to the Alvin Rosenzweig Show uh, and our series called Parsha and Prose uh, together with my co-host Rabbi Shlomo Gamora. How are you, Rabbi? Baruch Hashem, thank you for asking. Uh, you know, the year comes to an end um, and it's time to reflect on uh, the last year. So we had some terrible news. Um, I must say that one of my uh, beams of light of this year is uh, the podcast with you, uh, Avram. Um, I, I, I find it all not only entertaining uh, for myself and uh, enriching uh, myself, uh, but I think that we present a good model of how different Jews should um, live together and like each other despite their differences. And I wish that more people will watch not even the content, but the way we communicate. And I, I think people uh, realize that we are different and still can love each other like two good Jews. Yes, and I agree with you. And the good news is, is that uh, the show is really taking off. Our numbers are growing. Uh, and people are you know, commenting on exactly that and how it's a very, very unique show in terms of the content and the back and forth, the tete-a-tete -tete -tete between us. And I think that there's nothing else out there like that. So I'm looking forward to the new year, God willing, and that this show should even get better and better. And, and I have to tell you, Rob, and I've told you this before, I, I just enjoy doing it with you so much. I always try to stump you, and so far I have not been successful at it. Uh, you're a wonderful role model for myself and a great role model for so many others. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. As I said before, um, this podcast taught me something big about myself because sometimes you need someone to bring out qualities, things that um, normally you will not bring out. And I'm surprised from the reaction and the feedback of people to this um, podcast. Um, and I find it incredibly rewarding when people say, I learned something new today. Yeah, right. Um, and to me, it's the greatest achievement. It's not just the numbers, uh, which is nice to see, uh, are growing from one week to another, but it's this kind of uh, remark. Because what I want to do is to teach, to spread. And uh, when uh, people acknowledge it, I feel incredibly good. I, I also do. Because what you're saying is that when we come up with an idea, in, in, in the yeshiva world, they call it a chidush, right? And maybe a new revelation. That it is a form of creation, I find, right? Absolutely. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, it's called the Avram Rosenzweig Show, and the series is called Parsha and Pros. This is sponsored by the Professional Center. Now, today I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of what these folks do. Let's start here. Uh, it's Toronto's premier co-working space at 120 Adelaide, where more is the standard. The industry leader since 1987, TPC offers... Private and team offices, fully equipped meeting rooms, collaborative workspaces, premium amenities, and exceptional hospitality. Uh, book a day, a week, however long you need. Escape work from distractions and discover more privacy, more productivity, and more community at TPC. For more information, visit the Professional Center at theprofessionalcenter.com. How was that, Rabbi? Was that good? You know what? Uh, as I said before, uh, maybe one of our podcasts should be a great idea. recorded there. It uh, looks magnificent. That is a great idea. And I want everybody to remember that uh, these podcasts require uh, sponsorship and they also require individuals to make what we call donations in order to sustain them. So please be in touch with me at avram.rosenzweig at gmail.com if you'd like to sponsor the show if you'd like to be a donor and uh, we can figure out how to do that for you avram.rosenswag at gmail.com now the idea behind Parsha and Pros is that 
the rabbi and I learned the Parsha together with you, and we, we share it through the lens of classic literature. So as an example, this week is Parshat Kitavo. Some people say Kisavoy. And uh, we are learning it through the lens of a phenomenal book called I, Claudius by Robert Graves. There's a series which you can find on YouTube considered to be one of the greatest series ever. Now, Rabbi, just to get things going, why do some say Kitavo and some say Kisavoy? Um, this is an interesting question, and it's uh, another um, expression of the Galut, the exile of the Jewish people. Um, I don't know how it was pronounced uh, 2,000 years ago, um, but when people went to different places, they developed different uh, ways even to express the letters. And, you know, sometimes it caught me to believe that maybe, and I can bring a few um, scholastic proofs to it, that it will depend on different areas of where Jewish people lived. Some of them in the Galilee, some of them are more in the Negev of today or in the center. And they develop different accents uh, to certain things. Now, clearly, I can tell you that the Sephardi Jews who went to Egypt or in North Africa, uh, they kept somehow the uh, what is a modern Hebrew accent today, like ki kavo, uh, ki teitze, uh, while the Ashkenazic Jews uh, kept apparently a different dialect of the language, which is ki savo. Now, for the people who know Hebrew, they know that in the taf, uh, like another uh, five letters, when it appears in the beginning of a word, you actually make it more pronounced. Dagesh, mm -hmm. it's more highlighted. Uh, when there is no um, a, this dagesh, this little dot, uh, it's the taf is more like th in English, which is interesting, right? It's like not ta, like regular t. It's more th tha. Now, the interesting, uh, even more interesting is that indeed few communities like in Iraq or Yemen also kept it this way. Uh, they, again, the accent is slightly different, but they kept very well um, uh, the way uh, of pronouncing certain words. Now, the most amazing thing to me is, remember, they spoke in Yemen Arabic and in Russia Russian and in Poland Polish, but Jews continue to speak Hebrew or not to speak or to know Hebrew, let's put it this way, and to teach Hebrew. Uh, and they kept over 2,000 years a certain tradition. When they came back to Israel, they brought it back with them. I find it incredible because by most nations, they will mingle, they will forget everything. And, you know, I like to tell you stories. Listen to the following story. Mm -hmm. uh, you have some time for it? I have a little bit of time. Nothing else happening here. Okay, wonderful. Uh, one day, I went uh, to um, a, a grocery store in, um, uh, it was Lawrence and Dufferin area in Toronto. And um, there was a very nice lady there um, who ran the, the shop. And she asked me uh, to my name. I said, my name is Shlomo. She said, oh, this sounds like a very Hebrew name. I said, yes. She said, my son is Binyamin. I said, oh, you must be Jewish. She said, no, hmm. I'm Assyrian. I'm Assyrian. Um, a Assyrian. I never heard about it even. I, I thought like, okay, Assyria, we, I know it's Ashur, but Assyrian, like, are they still exist? And to my surprise, she told me the story of her clan. Um, um, they were exiled by no other than Saddam Hussein. Uh, this is uh, actually was a big group um, in northern Iraq, a uh, few million of people uh, who were indigenous to this area. Saddam Hussein did not want them to be there. And uh, in order to control, he tried to break all historical ties of the different tribes in Iraq. And he exiled and murdered many of the Assyrian people. Now listen to the most amazing part of the story. So she, I said, so are you speaking Aramaic? I said, Shh. she said, yes. I said, you know, it would be interesting like to see if we have uh, commonalities. 
And we start to speak, and it's not the same as the Aramaic of the Talmud, but they still speak Aramaic, uh, which is more, for the people who know, Jonathan ben Uziel, he also have Aramaic, but a, a more ancient Aramaic. It's like a, what Shakespearean is to English today, something like this. But I could recognize many of the words. And then I told her that I'm teaching in a Hebrew school, and she said, listen, I must... Um, and make a connection between you and the board of the private Assyrian school. They have on Sunday, uh, for the people who came from Assyria, a school, and they try to teach them Assyrian. And they apparently don't uh, experience great success. So she said, you Jews somehow kept your language. Maybe you can teach us how to preserve the Assyrian language. And they said, this would be a fantastic idea. And she made this connection. I came to one of the board meetings and I spoke about our experience in preserving the Hebrew. Um, so, um, you know, we we spoke about it a few times, how we share our blessing with the world. And we have many blessings. And one of them, how you keep a language alive uh, for thousands of years. Um, I was very happy to share with them. Uh, since then, I don't have connection with the this private um, Assyrian school, but it was a fantastic experience that I, I tell my students how important uh, some people believe is to keep your tradition and your history through the we, language. We, we should mention, by the way, that uh, we do this podcast when you are in your office at CHAT, which is a community right. high, Jewish community and, high. And I apologize for no, some okay. phone calls and things like this. But also, I, again, I, it's a very busy place. You see, no, we don't God. work only on Sundays. We work <laughs> every day of the week. And some people still don't know that we are recording it at this time. So they they call me. Sorry. Uh, I, I happen to like the rawness of the show. Sometimes you'll notice my cat, Jack, beautiful, gorgeous white cat, creation of God, uh, will creep up behind me. And I used to be embarrassed by it. But then I figured, you know what? Let's be just be natural. Let's be raw about this. So we don't mind at all, Rabbi. Um, hey, Avrum, do you have a cat? You are a cat person? Yes, I became a cat person a number of years ago. I used to be a dog person. Are you an oh, animal person? Not at all. You know, at all? I, nothing? Not at all. Um, actually, last week, one of our good friends uh, brought um, a dog that they got from their child. And, you know, we, we felt at home like, whoa, this is a completely <laughs> new experience. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny. But one advice, you know, after this week, don't bring your cat or your dog to Springfield, uh, Avrum. <laughs> Rabbi, I try to stay away from these things because I know you're a little bit more right wing. No, no, I don't that. want to come into <laughs> politics. <laughs> that's, more my, that's more my joke. But, Rabbi, I will tell you one thing. Uh, I've had a cat for probably about 10 years now, and I watch my cat, and I see how magnificent it, it is. And I often think about you know, God was sitting with the angels one day and said, today we're going to create an animal that can jump from a sitting position to the top of the credenza in my living room. It's probably about seven feet tall. And I see what this animal has the ability to do, how it can really, really become very compact in order to get through a small crack in the door and to protect itself. Um, and the, uh, the reason I tell you this is because I know what a curious fellow you are. I love the idea that when you wanted to understand the science of the shofar, you took some horn lessons. I love that about you. And I love the idea that when you wanted to understand ancient Rome, you took a course on how to be a tour guide. So I hope you have some exposure to animals, because if you don't, you're missing out on a huge part of creation. It might be true, but, you know... Um, Get a hamster. My parents and my... my um, a wife's parents are Holocaust survivors, so this yeah. eliminate yeah. immediately, like dogs, for some reason. Um, but maybe you're right. Um, you know, the Nechama, the comfort, uh, I can tell you that my son, um, who lives in Yerushalayim, uh, he has a dog, Chaser his name, and it's a very cute dog, so when we come, he's... Uh, I compensate a little bit for lack of pets in my house. But do you watch the dog to see its brilliance? Unfortunately. You don't. Unfortunately okay. not. I prefer to read a good book rather yeah, than I, like, walking with a dog in Jerusalem. Uh, but 
someone is doing it and I'm happy and, um, you know, whatever makes people happy. Because we spent, you know, it's something very interesting. You talk about dog. So here is a nice midrash. You know why a dog in Hebrew is kelev? Yeah, it's called lev, all heart. Right. It's like kulo lev. It's like, yeah, the heart. And um, I see, like, older people, one... Uh, Italian guy is walking um, next to my house every morning with his dog. And I'm sure if he would not have a dog, this person, yes. I don't know if he would be alive. Very old guy in his late 90s and walking with the dog every day. So it gives apparently some um, uh, meaning uh, that I don't see to myself, but apparently there are people who it's very meaningful for them. Well, I well, hear well, it's, a, it's a billions of dollars industry in America and... That it I is. The, the, I'll, I'll end with this thought that I have a connection with my cat, Jack, whereby he can look in my eyes and I'll look in his eyes. And I know that I don't understand his thinking, but I also recognize at that very moment, he and I are in sync. We are in touch. And sometimes he'll nuzzle his head against my face. And I'm thinking there is a point where humankind meets animals and that 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 is deeply deeply intriguing to me and maybe we'll cover that more so when we do parshat noah god exactly, exactly. Uh, ladies and ladies and gentlemen today in parsha and pro we're looking at parsha kitavo uh through the lens of i claudius the torah portion kitavo which means when you enter covers deuteronomy 26 1 to 29 8 it addresses the israelites as they prepare to enter the promised land and it outlined key aspects of covenantal life, including instructions for bringing the first fruits to the temple as an act of gratitude and reciting a declaration of God's deliverance from Egypt. The portion also details the blessings that will follow if the Israelites obey God's commandments and the curses that will result from disobedience. By framing the relationship between obedience and its outcome, Kitavo emphasizes the importance of faithfulness and commitment to the covenant as central to the community's prosperity and well-being in their new land. Uh, I, Claudius, it's written by Robert Graves. It's a compelling historical novel that immerses readers in the tumultuous world of ancient Rome through the eyes of its unlikely emperor, Claudius. Presented as an autobiography, the novel captures Claudius's journey from a stammering, overlooked member of the imperial family to a shrewd and highly insightful ruler. Through his detailed narrative, Claudius exposes the intrigue, betrayal, and ruthless politics that characterizes the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Graves masterfully combines historical fact with vivid characterizations, creating a rich tapestry of Roman history that is both educational and captivating. The novel's exploration of power, ambition, and survival remains a fascinating and enduring piece of historical fiction. So, Rabbi, when you made our chart reflecting the Parshiot and the equivalent novel. Why did you choose I, Claudius, for Kitavo? Because my love, I wouldn't say love, but interest in the, in the Roman Empire. Um, listen, this is an empire that everyone was sure will never fall. Will never. Like, it's like today to say that, you know, one day America will will be of no importance. You, we cannot even fathom or imagine anything like this. And in our parsha, the Torah has a very grim prediction that uh, the Jewish people are going to be successful, but it can turn around. It can turn around and it will be the fall of the Jewish people. So it's not like a one-side promise. And I find the history of Rome, the rise and fall uh, of Rome, something that all humanity can learn, but I think we, the Jewish people, have a very special insight into their rise and fall of nation. And that's why I thought uh, this magnificent book uh, can be a very good um, a beginning to discuss our parsha. Now, I just want to say one thing because I find this book uh, fascinating because it takes what my history teachers taught me in a very boring way and a very uh, not uplifting uh, way, he takes history and make it an amazing story. Yeah. And I would say that every teacher should see or to, uh, 
I just heard that uh, like there is a whole series that went in uh, England. I just learned it when I prepared for this um, discussion. Uh, but to read the book, it's a fantastic book into the nature of leadership, of emperors, of people, uh, their families. Um, I find it just incredible. And I also, as usual, find the difference between the approach of the Torah to the approach of, for example, Claudius, who uh, was a historian. Um, and I think this difference make a, a whole world of difference between the way we think about history and uh, the non-Jewish world, especially the rulers and the conquerors think about history. And maybe we will expose it uh, in this uh, podcast. Just to reflect on a point that you made within your explanation as to why you chose these two together. What, what do you do as a teacher fundamentally to make sure that your students are fascinated by what you're teaching them? What are your tools? I will give you one line and I share it with every teacher who wants to learn it. Um, and this is make everything to a story. Mm. Um, my love for stories started in a very young age. Um, I think that I shared with you that my mother lost her parents in the Holocaust, but yeah. when she came in the a at the age of nine um, to Israel after the Holocaust, or maybe even younger, her grandparents uh, were alive and they were in Israel. They came to Israel in the 30s. Uh, they were alive. And so my mother, after losing her family, came to Israel. She, for the first time, uh, met her grandparents. She never saw them again. And she um, lived with them. She uh, took care over them in a magnificent way. I remember it as a child. <coughs> and my great grandfather and great grandmother lived with us until I was seven years old. And uh, my great grandfather, he was a Boyaner Hosid, a um, very pious person. He told me many stories in Yiddish. That's why I can understand Yiddish until today. Unfortunately, I did not have many people, especially after he passed away. They passed away. I did not have many people to practice my Yiddish, but I understand Yiddish pretty well until now. And he told me stories. And my mother is retelling me that many, many times I went to him um, and asking him to tell me the stories about Yosef and the Chav and, and so on and so on. So I loved stories and I was aware of the power of stories in a very young age. And I continue it until this very day. And to me, uh, every subject, every single subject, is a story about yourself if you teach it properly, even math. Um, yesterday, I just went into a math class, and I don't know if I told you, but I was in Israel. I was a math teacher, too. Yes. Um, but um, And we spoke about the development of math, because they spoke about gematria, you know, this like numerical value of uh, letters in Hebrew, and I asked them what gematria comes from. And we spoke about geometry. Geo, land, metry, measure, meter. And I spoke that actually no one invented math in the classroom. They invented it when they had to divide um, fields, when they had to measure um, after the father passed away, how to divide the field between people. And they developed all kinds of mathematical tools uh, that we know today, uh, geometry and formulas, to understand how rules are working for their own life. Then, unfortunately, something that came naturally uh, because people needed it became a subject and they kill it all together. Because if you talk with many, many students about math, there is nothing that they hate more than math. And this is so sad because math is life itself. It's life itself because the way it was developed, if people just understand how a concept and formulas were developed, they developed by life themselves. And once students start to think about it, I hope they <coughs> change their attitude towards subjects as geometry and math. It's not uh, boring anymore. It's really touching life and explain you how civilization moved on and on. Um, and 
uh, how science is so important for the for human beings but it has to be a story if it's not a story it's just a bunch of uninteresting facts that people have difficulty to deal with do you see god in numbers oh absolutely yes there is no question about it if you want to really see god you have to know uh, math very very well uh, this exact formula this uh need to prove things um, the order, the order, and actually when you go more and more into math, um, you will discover it more and more. Um, um, I, I don't think it's for this podcast. Maybe uh, we will do another one. Um, I, I had, when I was in Yerushalayim, I met uh, Professor Hillel um, uh, Fristenberg. He's, uh, if there was, it would be a Nobel Prize for math, there is no one because the rumors say that uh, Alfred Nobel hated math, so he did not want uh, anyone to uh, uh, get a Nobel Prize for math. But if there would be one, Hilary Fustenberg would, uh, would get it uh, with no question. He got any other important um, uh, award in, in the math field. And when I went to Daven on Sukkot last year, I met him in shul. I couldn't believe it. Like one of uh, my uh, mathematical heroes. Yeah. He's Jew. He was learning in the Torah. And I spoke to him and I asked him the same question that you ask me now. And he said, there is no question. And he said, the more you know math, the more you discovered God in the formulas and in the concepts of math, which I find very fascinating. All right. I'm taking some notes here because a few shows ago, you said one day we have to do uh, a, a show about the Torah in the context of history. And I think that would be a, a very interesting podcast. And I'm also going to take a note that we'll do uh, math within the Torah construct. Beseder? Absolutely. Now, Rabbi, how does Kitavo or Kisavoy address the theme of reward and punishment compared to the way I, Claudius, depicts the consequences of political actions? Okay, um, so this is a good question to jump into the way we see history in general. Uh, because if you read uh, I, Claudius, you get the impression that things are always about motivation, about greed, about uh, seek of power, um, and things are happening in a way that is uh, an expression to the human nature and only the human nature. By us, history is something very, very different. Um, and I want to start with the beginning of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments start, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am your God, the Lord your God. And you would expect the following words to be, who created heaven and earth. <laughs> because this is the most magnificent thing that God ever did. But no. It said, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Otseiticha Me'eretz Mitzrayim. I took you out of Egypt. And this compared to creation seems to be very insignificant. What is it? Okay, so God took us out of Mitzrayim, but how can you compare it to the mountain, to the rivers, to the sea, to the uh, astronomical body? The answer is that Jews see God, first of all, the God of history. The God of history, we believe that God involved in history, and this is actually his greatest power to us. And therefore, the uh, Ten Commandments start with the declaration, I am the God of history. And the Jewish people have to remember it through the years, through the generations, through the millennia. I was already involved in history and I will continue to be involved in history. And from here to your question, if God is the God of history, then obviously he wants human being and the world to be part of the reason why he created the world. And it, the system is very simple. If we fulfill the mission of God in creating the world, then God is going to reward us. And us, I'm not talking only about the Jewish people. He is going 
to benefit the entire world. If we not sync our deeds with the mission statement of the world, which is to show the beauty of uh, the human being, the greatness of human being, the um, God and his values, uh, uh, the most important thing uh, in the world and how people live their lives, this will be by itself a punishment. You don't have to go to plagues in order to punish a person. The fact that you don't follow the uh, wonderful rule that God gave us, this by itself is uh, the punishment, and we will talk about it more about um, uh, the, the book next next week. But yes, this is the difference. It's not just because people arrange it. There is a divine plan uh, that helped the world or warned the world how to live its life. So at the end of the Parsha, there are copious numbers of psukim having to do with the curses that the Jewish people will get for not following uh, God's laws. Uh, are, are those actual curses? In other words, will the sensitive man become a barbarian, the sensitive woman uh, eat her children, you know, or, or is it metaphorical? I don't think it's metaphoric. Um, the Ramban, Nachmanides, who lived in the 13th century, a conclude um, his commentary on this awful, awful description of the Torah yeah. and say there is not even one curse that did not fulfill. Now, the Ramban lived uh, about uh, 800 years ago. He didn't see the Holocaust. And I think that today we can say clearly that there is no one curse in our Torah that the Jewish people did not experience and i'm afraid to say but maybe even more than that uh we exceeded our experience exceeded even the curses of the torah unfortunately so no it's not metaphoric at all we we had our fair share um and you know there is a minag there is a custom uh when you read this awful description in the torah to read it uh, in a very low voice Yes, yes. Uh, I heard, I think, from Rabbi Riskin once that um, the young person, he went to the minion of the Kloisenberger Rebbe. The Kloisenberger Rebbe lost, I think, 11 of his children in the Holocaust. Can you imagine, like, entire family, 11 children in the Holocaust? And when the, uh, the, the laner, the one who laned the Torah, uh, started to lane it, um, uh, quietly, uh, the minag requires say, no, 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 scream it, scream it, because I know that we experience every single curse. So I want the Ribbono Shalom to hear that his children actually got more than their fair share, and it's time for redemption. I've heard that people will not accept an aliyah on Shabbat to come up to the Torah and make the brachot, the blessings. For the curses, would you go up for that? For for that? Uh, actually, that's a minag. The minag is uh, to uh, honor the rabbi with uh, with this uh, aliyah because you don't want to uh, give anyone impression that when the the bal koyer, when the one who learned the parshiot is actually think about the one next to him. So, in order to solve the problem, they give it to the rabbi. <laughs> How does the rabbi feel about that? Um. Well, again, for a person who was lucky to born um, um, 15 years I, after my parents and my, my in-laws uh, went through these curses, um, I feel that it's about time that, you know, God will redeem the Jewish people. And um, unfortunately, especially the last year, it was not like this. Um, so so I feel bad. I feel the pain of the Jewish people, and I hope for days that indeed the, the good part, the blessings are going to be fully fulfilled. Rabbi, by the way, you know, you spoke about going to the Assyrian board meeting, and I thought that's fantastic that you're getting out there. It's a real Kiddush Hashem. It's really glorifying God and the Jewish people. But my brother-in-law attends a kolel at uh, a local shul, and uh, you gave a um, a, a speech of sorts, a shiur last week on minhagim, on tradition, and I want you to know that they really embraced it and they thought you were terrific. 
Oh, thank you. I, that, that's the first uh, feedback I get from my share. And I really thank you for it. And you know, I would advise every one of our listeners, if you heard something good, just f- give yeah. a good feedback. Great, great. Good, good for you. That's right. Be show Hakar Satov, right? Be it's not only Hakar Satov, but you know what? Many times I give Shurim, I don't get any money. I do it out of love. The only reward that is really meaningful for me is like a good word. I I learned something new. I was inspired. I, uh, you gave me something to think about. Wow, that made my day. You know, my mother, Gitel Rosenzweig, she should rest in peace. You knew her well. Um, she would read an article in the Kitchener Record where my parents lived or the Toronto Star, and she would like it. She would promptly either pick up the phone or write a letter to the journalist expressing her gratitude uh, generally is about the Jewish people in Israel and support of them. And just to tell them, thank you so much. It was really, really special what you did. Um, I I can tell you, uh, I used to dub in Eila in uh, Orchaim. She used to come. Yeah. And it was Davar Kavua, like always, never missed one time. And when I uh, ate the Suda to break the fast, she was already on the phone. I'm sure that she did not eat yet to say, Rabbi Gemara, yes. I really enjoyed your davening. And to me, this was the best part of davening, although it was like 15 minutes after. Yes, thank you. In what way does the depiction of leadership in Kitavo differ from the portrayal of leadership in I, Claudius? In two ways. Number one, uh, in I, Claudius, it described as a mess of different interests. Listen, you, you read I, Claudius, and I thought that I know about Rome enough, but no, because the beauty of this book is to tell you about the real people behind the great moves. You read about Tiberius, the person, by the way, that our beloved city, Tveria, is named after. Uh, he was a, a, an awful person, as you can read there, and uh, a murderer who was murdered at the end, uh, like most of the people in iCloud, you see, no, no one almost uh, ended his life uh, in bed. Um, a, and you get the impression that leadership is about your power, your ability to conquer, your ability to politically maneuver and manipulate your... Uh, opponents, the Torah gave a very different uh, kind of story. The Torah see the leadership and the responsibility of the leadership to make sure that people, that the nation, live their life in the right way. And their failure as leaders on the moral field, on the moral issues, this is what will cause the fail of a king or a family of kings, unlike what I, Claudius, describe uh, as just one family was stronger than the other one, or one lady um, um, was more manipulative uh, than the other one. Uh, so this is a very interesting topic, just to see the, the women in I, Claudius, um, from Livia, um, the, the wife of uh, Augustus, and the way she fought for Tiberius to become the Caesar. So you get the idea that it's all about political power. The Torah say no, no. It doesn't mean that in ruling families in the Jewish people, you didn't have things like this. But the mission statement of the ruling family or the king is clearly to make sure that the nation live up to the moral standards of the Torah which is very, very different from I, Claudius, because in I, Claudius, it's about political power, not moral one. And actually, the moral people, like Claudius himself, are people who will suffer and most likely will be killed. No one wants to hear morality in Rome. It, it, did you find that there's uh, some correlations between I, Claudius, and, and uh, Machiavellian uh, uh, politics? T- totally. Yeah. Totally. And you don't have to go to Machiavelli, who actually advise and see the Roman uh, emperors or Caesars before as a role model for their ruling family, for the Medici family, uh, which is a 
the, the one that he advised, um, he actually called them, Hindi quote many, many times, how the Roman emperors did not care one iota about their people. They just care about their power. And he warns him, if he's not going to use his political power, he will be dead. He will be dead. That's how they saw politics and the, how they saw um, a, a, the a, ability to rule. And think, think just about the mother, uh, about Livia, who killing her two sons in order to make sure that Tiberius is getting uh, to be the emperor. This is unbelievable against anything that we feel is moral. But for them, don't speak about morality. Speak about power and the ability to rule. That's it. That's the only thing which is important. By the way, that's why Claudius managed to uh, rule for many years because he would consider to be an idiot. He would consider to be a person who is not showing any threat to anybody. So they choose him um, as a person who is not going to do any problem. But if they would see him as a person who seek power, I'm sure that uh, Claudius would be killed uh, in, in his first or second year, if at all he would become uh, emperor. Rabbi, the, um, my next question, uh, I will give a part A and a part B to it. Uh, in Kitavo, it, it includes really a fascinating ritual involving the setting up of stones with inscriptions. Um, and, I, and I'm curious how, how this ritual compares to the way historical records and legacies are managed in I, Claudius. But before we, you answer that, I, I, I want to ask you sort of a part B here because I'm so curious about this. In uh, Peric 28, chapter 28, in line 61, it says as follows, even any illness and any blow that is not written in the book of the Torah, Hashem will bring upon you until you are destroyed. And that's in the context of the curses. I took a little, I did a little research on the fact that the book of Torah was actually mentioned in the Torah to determine if there were any other places within the five books where the word Torah or the actual Torah is mentioned. And I'm not sure it is. So is this the only place in the Torah where the Torah, the word Torah is mentioned? Uh, you touch upon a very important uh, question, and this is, what is the Torah? What is the Torah? Uh, is it uh, like one body of literature that was given in once? Uh, was it something that was collected over time? Um, and I'm not talking now about very modern uh, approach to Torah. I'm, you know, I'm a rabbi, I'm an Orthodox rabbi. Uh, but our sages themselves um, have different views how the Torah was given. If it was Megillot, Megillot, if it was given, um, you know, um, a, every time uh, Moshe Rabbeinu came and gave them another piece of Torah, another piece uh, of Parshiot, uh, was it actually all dictated uh, in advance or not? This is a major, major question. And the question you raised about the finding a Torah within the Torah <laughs> uh, hints actually that they had writings that consisted of parts of the Torah and it called Torah. And only in the last year of the life of Moshe Rabbeinu, he gathered them together and edited it to one Torah. Obviously, it was, a, a, according to Nebuah, a prophecy that he got from God, but it was putting together a different parts of the Torah that were separated until this time and making them the Torah as we know today. So this is a huge issue, and uh, you maybe ask uh, some scholars, because um, until this very day, one of the most uh, debated issues, how the Torah was given, what exactly it uh, was before Moshe Rabbeinu gave us uh, the five books of the Torah. A very interesting and important and very important uh, topic. Can you answer my first question then? What, there, there's this ritual in, stated in the Torah about setting up stones with inscriptions on it. And my question then was, how does this ritual compare to the way historical records and legacies are managed in I, I Claudius? Well, you see, that's exactly the point that I mentioned. The Torah never says, write down your history. No, you don't find it. We have one mitzvah to tell the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim, and maybe we will talk about it, because interestingly enough, 
the first parsha of Kitabo is the foundation to our Lela Seder. In Lela Seder, we don't tell the stories from the book of Exodus, which is quite amazing. We take this portion that is talking about the beautiful mitzvah of bringing our fruit to the temple, the first fruit of the temple, and the verses there are the foundation of Haggadah of Pesach. Uh, which means the Torah is not interested so much in the little facts of history. This is not what's important. History has destination. And the destination is the nation that represents God in the world. So on these stones, you write the Torah. Because you want to remind the people who are entering their land and going to live normal life now, what is important about life? And these are the verses in script on the plaster uh, of, the, of the rocks. And this will be a constant reminder. Why are you in Eretz Israel? But the Torah never asks to write uh, down um, every little, where they cross exactly the Jordan, how many people crossed uh, the first hour, and so on and so on. This is for historians. The Torah is not about history. The Torah is about the lessons of history. And I heard once that in Hebrew, it's very interesting. Historia, you say it in Hebrew, is hester, like the hidden part, yeah, of God. So historia is like the way nice. God hides himself in the world through history, which I find very, very interesting and the cute idea. Um, so in... in I, Claudius, Claudius himself, see himself as a historian. Actually, in the first chapter, he speaks about the fact that he wants to bring uh, a, all the poisons of Rome and to hush them because he saw history as, as the mud of all kinds of poisonous um, creatures and, and forces. And the Torah see history so much different. The, the Torah see history as just a course of opportunities to do the right thing. And sometimes the shame has to bring us back to do the right thing if we don't do them uh, at this point. So this is very different. Uh, I, Claudius, try to be a history account. The Torah is not about history accounts. It's about, as I say, the lessons of history. What do we have to take and to learn from history? Rabbi, what is the role of divine intervention in Kitavo, and how does it contrast with the influence of the gods and fate in I, Claudius? Well, that's the the most important difference between our Torah and I, Claudius. And when I talk about I, Claudius, the way a great rulers like Caesars and emperors saw themselves in history. By the Torah, the world run by divine force. Mm -hmm. um, there is a system in place but everything is controlled by God corresponding with our morality. That's very important because obviously uh, the heaven are for God. We as human beings has to run this world. We don't, we don't expect God to run the world for us. We have to do it. But the Torah is very clear that if we run the world, if we run business, it has to be kosher business. If we treat other people, it has to be according to the guidelines of the Torah. If we treat our workers, it has to be in a certain way. In Rome, they never heard about it. They never heard about, as I said before, morality has nothing to do with politics. It's completely separate realms that don't touch each other. And I think that that's why to me, is important to read a book like I, Claudius, because then you really understand what the Torah opposing, what the Torah cannot accept, because oh, the Torah is exactly yeah. the opposite of everything that I, Claudius, describe about Rome, about the, the, the terrible forces behind the scene that Beautiful. just asking to seek and to gain power. The Torah is so much against it, so much. Which explains why we're doing this series, doesn't it? Exactly. It gives because a greater context a to the Torah. Like this, yeah. A partial like this, like this, bring to the reader the beauty of Judaism, how we see the world around us, and how the world think about himself. Um, and 
that's why, by the way, I believe that the Torah does not uh, write a lot about history because history always is written from a standpoint of the person who writes it. And, um, you know, I, Claudius, just describe it beautifully, how he writes the history of the Claudian family um, and um, the, the Julius, uh, it comes from Julius Caesar, obviously, Julius uh, uh, Augustus and, and yeah, Tiberius until it comes to Claudius. Um, we see it a very, in a very different way. As I say, the Torah is not interested in the history itself. But the Torah said, see history, what do we learn from here? We learn that empires rise and fall because moral issues. And I don't want you, the Jewish people, to fall because you don't fulfill your mission in the world. There are some really classic lines that we find in I, Claudius. One of them is, let all, all the poisons that lurk in the mud hatch out. This quote reflects the... Yeah, pervasive... I think in the very beginning, in the first uh, yeah. chapter. Yeah. Right, right. You know the quote? Yeah, it's a, it's a famous one. The, right. the poison uh, in the mud. Yeah, absolutely. It, it reflects... and, you know, the, the way he, he, he described himself, I, Claudius, who was once, and not so long ago, known to my friends, family, and associates as Claudius the idiot, that Claudius, the stammerer, <coughs> am now about to write this strange history of my life. So that's how he perceived himself as a historian. Um, and the, the Torah sees it in a very, very different way. Very different way. The Torah it tests everything about its morality, which I have to connect to our days. You know, people talk about the war in Gaza and... Um, you know, universities and so on. I want to tell you something. The way I see it, everyone or anyone who can identify himself with the people of Hamas in any way, he belongs to the wrong side of history because what the Torah is teaching us is that history is just about morality. And people who behave in a way that they can kill tough as they can, like children, babies, older people who are civilians, and you can identify with them in any way. A, f a freedom fighter, what, whatever they call it, in <coughs> my opinion, in my opinion, they are so much against the idea and the concept of the Torah, not that the Jewish thing. But the Torah washed the world in a very binary way. You are moral or not moral. And I think that the war in Gaza right now, what is happening now in Israel, is just put the focus on this issue. Are you are a moral person or not? That's it. There is no other question. Uh, I just want to pick up on the idea of this plethora of very classic and well-known quotes in I, Claudius. Uh, and I want to bring it back to Kitavo. There's another quote in I, Claudius, which is the only thing we have to fear is the loss of our freedom to choose. Now, in Kitavo, <coughs> excuse me, in Kitavo, we see that there are blessings that Jewish people will get for following God's uh, instructions. And then there are curses that the Jewish people will get if they do not. Is there an inherent freedom of choice within that? Um, absolutely, yes. And we saw in Parashat Re'eh that God, when he presented the Torah to the Jewish people, he asked them to choose. And I think it gave us a, under, a better understanding of what the punishments are all about. Listen, if we are unique people and perceived as unique people that bring the voice of God to the world, even if we are minority, if we are only millions out of billions and billions of people, we are important. We are needed to the world. What the Torah is saying, if you are going to be like the other forces around you, if you are going to look like the Moabites or the Edomites or the Canaanites, and you lose your special culture and special identity, who needs you in the world? 
it's going to be like clearly you are going to be just part of the pawns on the chess uh, board and you know one uh, ruler will come and bring you to egypt another one to assyria one uh, to um uh, all over the world if we are not important if we don't bring a special voice to the world we are just part of the world and the winds of the world and the power of the world and you will never if you are only 15 million people in a world of 7 billion, you are going to be erased very, very fast. Unless these 15 million people bring something unique to the world, and we do. We bring something very, very special to the world. And therefore, it's beyond the number, beyond the quantity. It's about the characteristics of the Jewish people, the qualities of the Jewish people. And that's why we still survive. I want to touch upon a few points within the Parsha, and I want to get your take on it, just independent points. Uh, in 27, 18, it says as follows. A cursed is one who causes a blind person to go astray on the road, and the entire people shall say, Amen. Is that literally not directing a blind individual in the wrong way? Is that the Torah is telling us? I want to make sure that I understand your question. It, the the Parsha says, a cursed is one who causes a blind person to go astray on the road. Oh, yes. My question is to find that. So you see here is the place where you need a Midrash, a beautiful Midrash. The words mean that physically you cannot stumble a blind person, which I don't know how many mean people are going to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but our sages take it to a more common scenario. And this is when we give a bad advice to our friends. Because sometimes for all kinds of reasons, competition or greed or whatever the reason is, someone come to ask you something and you will give him the wrong advice because you think you profit from it or um, you think that um, you do a service to your family, <coughs> whatever the case is, what Chazal called a tzara, bad advice. And Chachamim saw a, a stumbling block, not only in a physical one, on the contrary, they saw it as life. A person think that you are his friend or your professional and they seek your advice and you cause him to fall. And I heard about so many stories like this, uh, unfortunately, that people uh, causing another person to fall uh, metaphorically. And the Torah said, when you come to the land, sometimes you will have this inclination. You know, you want to buy a field. Your friend comes to you and he asks you about this field. He also interested in it. And you give him a bad advice. No, no, don't, don't go for it. Uh, it's not good for you in order to get the field for yourself. This is uh, putting like a stumbling block before a blind person. He's not blind physically, but his mind is blind and you help him to fall. So it's much more uh, expansive rather than just like a block on the road. One of the things that I love so much about uh, uh, the Jewish people and our Torah is the practical um, reasoning behind many of the mitzvot. As an example, when I learned the first time, or the first time I was really conscious about it, about Maser Sheni, that tithing, uh, it's called the second tithing, that one is responsible for taking. And what are you supposed to do with it? Well, you're supposed to take it up to Jerusalem and you're supposed to eat it in Jerusalem. You can, re you can, you can sell it first and redeem it in Jerusalem. And then I looked into some of the meaning behind the idea because it's a trek, it's a journey for many people. And to some extent, it's the idea of hobnobbing with the righteous within Jer J Jerusalem. And I thought, how magnificent is that? How beautiful is that? The idea that the Torah is telling you is who you hang out with makes a difference in your life. Now, this week's Parsha, the Torah Akitavo, begins with the idea of Bikurim. And I just want to read one or two lines. It will be when you enter the land Hashem, your God, gives you as an inheritance. An inheritance is a very important word here. And you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take of the ver first of every fruit of the ground you, you bring in from your land, from the, I'm sorry, from your land that Hashem your God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket 
and go to the place that Hashem, your God, will choose to make his name rest there. Long and short of it is that you share it with the Kohen, the priest. He puts his hand under your basket. They bring it to the holy place and the altar. And there are many different schools of thought on what is Bikurim. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Sachrini Levracha, he sees Bikurim as a profound expression of gratitude and recognition of divine providence. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, his perspective on Bikurim is very philosophical. He views the practice as an embodiment of the ethical dimension of Judaism, where bringing the first fruit signifies a commitment to justice and communal responsibility. I, I have a very powerful imagination. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm, I'm sensing in my mind the idea, here's a farmer. And the Jewish people have only been in Israel for a very short while. They've won the war. And he is growing grapes. And he has to tie a little ribbon around the first of the grapes, put it in a basket, and take it to the Kohen. And, and there, again, there are many different reasons for it. But I find that to be so beautiful that you have to be conscious of the land, that you have to be conscious of the fruit, and that you have to be aware of the fact that none of this would happen if it wasn't for God. What, what's your perspective on Bikurim? Uh, absolutely. I think it was one of the most magnificent sights to see uh, convoys of people coming from all over with their fruits. And by the way, our sages are describing um, uh, those, those um, uh, people who came to Jerusalem, they decorated with all kinds of ornaments their, their uh, donkeys and horses. And there was such a festive feeling in the air from yeah, the right, time right. of Shavuot until the time of Sukkot. It <clears throat> was a daily thing that people brought their fruits and they came to Yerushalayim and everyone uh, was smiling to them and say Shalom Aleichem and stood to respect the fact that they come to Yerushalayim. So it was way more than just like bringing the first fruit, which have a theological uh, value, obviously, to recognize that who gave you these blessings. But it was a time of bonding of the Jewish people and seeing the great people of Jerusalem. Usually, it was the Kohanim, the rabbis, uh, to um, you know, to speak to them, to show your child, give a shalom aleichem to this rabbi, to this yeah. Kohen. I think right. it just was such a family and community event that is magnificent. You know, I just want to say one thing about the Maser Sheni, in order to bring it closer to home. You know, sometimes you go, you want to go to Jerusalem, but when you consult your your bank, you find out that you don't have enough money to go for a family vacation in Jerusalem, which is not uh, very cheap. And I think that the Torah thought about it. You know, the whole idea of Maser Sheni, that you redeem the fruits, but you have to then to buy food in Jerusalem, make sure that the Torah uh, made like, a way, a method of saving funds so you can take your family to Jerusalem and don't find in the last minute that uh, you cannot uh, you cannot bring, break your budget. So the Torah built a small budget. Every year you put some <laughs> of the foods aside, you sell them and keep the money, but you cannot use the money in Toronto or even in Eilat, which are beautiful. You have to take the money and to bring it to Jerusalem. And then you are not going to be so concerned with the budget of the trip because already you have lots of money that you accumulated over the seven years. In five years out of the seven, you uh, get the money in order to make a, a family vacation in Yerushalayim, which is a very practical thing. But, you know, the Torah thought even about this one because many, many times the decision to go or not to go to Jerusalem is a budget decision. Yeah, it's a budgetary question, yes. Uh, Rabbi, you know that I've been playing around with AI a little bit, and I asked AI to uh, write a poem about Bikurim, and here's what I got. And I know that you said it lacks soul, and I hear it. I hear what you're saying, but I happen to like the poetry. So listen to this. Good. Yeah, yeah. In fields where ancient whispers weave, where grain and vine in earth's embrace, the Bikurim rise in golden sheaves, an offering of nature's grace. The harvest moon is silvered glow, glimmers on the ripened yield, as hands that toiled in sun and snow brings forth the fruits of fertile field. From olive groves and vine-clad hills, the firstborn bounty finds its way to sacred places holy still, where hearts in reverence softly sway. 
The basket born with humble pride is more than just a farmer's gift. It tells a faith that will not hide a blessings that in shadows lift. For in each ear of corn and grape, in every grain and fig so sweet, resides a story of escape and echoes of a past replete. A tribute to the land's embrace, to fields that yield and skies that bless, a gesture of enduring grace that shows our gratitude finesse. So let the Bikurim be displayed in honor of the earth's own song, a testament to hands that stayed and hearts that have been true and strong. What do you think of that? It's really beautiful. I must say it is. It is beautiful, beautiful isn't it? Um, yeah, and uh, it sounds like it's getting better by the week. It's frightening. <laughs> I know, I know. But I'm, I'm really, really happy that you like it. Rabbi, um, where do we... Yes, go ahead. Do you think that one day, like uh, in in shoes, they will have like uh, you know um, AI rabbi uh, <laughs> that, uh, is going to give the sermons? And you know what will be nice about it? They can uh, program it to uh, have only five minutes, so the rabbi cannot exceed it. Rabbi, I think, I it's think more that many people would like it. I think so too, but I think it's more practical to have an AI gabai. <laughs> because the guy struggle with who do you give who do you give the aliyah to? So bring it down to AI, and there will be no fighting, right? Okay. We're we're concluding the show, and this week we talked about Kitavo. Some people call it Kisavo, and we did so through the lens of I Claudius. Robbie, do you have any parting words? Parting words is I think the parting words of the Torah itself. First of all, the Torah starts with gratitude. We have to be grateful for many things, wonderful things in our life. Uh, and our life are not always very easy. But we have to recognize the things that we should be grateful for. And sometimes they are just around us and we don't recognize them enough. Family members, friends, people that we meet. So we have to uh, be very grateful. The second thing is our choices. Um, that we make, uh, the Torah is very clear that success means doing the right choices. I always tell it to my students, guys, it's your life. God is going to help you as long as you are going to do the right choices. And, you know, in the spirit of these days that we ask Hashem, Hashiveinu Hashem Elecha Venashuva, that we want to go back to the old good days that we felt close to Hashem and Hashem was close to us. Let's hope that these um, ancient words uh, will be the word that lead us from this year, Tavshin Peidalet, to the next year, uh, to a better year, where our relationship with Hashem are going to bring much redemption, comfort, and happy life to every single Jew. Amen. Do you find that your students have a sense of godliness? Some of them more than others. Um, I think that, you know, we talk about like emotional um, intelligence and um, I think that there is a religious uh, intelligence too. I can see people that, you know, sometimes they hear something and right away they are inspired. They will come to shul, they daven better. There are people who are less and uh, I guess that it has a lot with education a yes. lot uh, with education from very young age to recognize God in our life. I find it very artificial when you try to start in the age of 12 or 13 to teach people about religion. Uh, it's way too late, I'm afraid. I may be going to a Breslover shul this weekend. My niece in Israel is a Breslover, Tsipora, and she's a beautiful person with beautiful midot character um so i'm quite excited about it if i do go apparently have sort of a Karlbach friday night and that would be exciting i will report back on it anything exciting coming up with you this week something exciting um for me every day is very exciting nice overall. good answer i good go answer. here to the halls meet students some of them are smiling some of them have um uh, bedtime i don't know I, I feel very inspired by them. Uh, your story about going to Breslov, I just want to tell you one uh, amazing story that actually, I um, can't remember who was the, this uh, German scholar who decided, as it happened to many of them in the beginning of the 19th century, the 20th century, to 
get a job and in order to get a job um they had to baptize themselves and to convert to uh, Christianity, uh, something that they did not see at any problem. Uh, they, they just wanted to get the job. They were not very Jewish uh, at all. And he was scheduled to go on Sunday, I think, and Yom Kippur happened to be on Shabbat like this year. I think it was Franz Rosenzweig, if I'm not mistaken. I think uh, we are talking about Franz Rosenzweig. I will try to find the story. It's a very famous story. And he went to a little shul. For some reason, he did not want to go to the big shul in Berlin. I think he lived in Berlin because that he found the tefillah very, uh, not very uplifting. And he decided like the last day of, uh, of him being a Jew, he wanted to go to a little shibel of Hasidim that came from Poland and Maybe it was Leipzig, maybe it was not Berlin, cannot remember. I'll find the story for the next time. And whoa, what an experience. He changed completely over Yom Kippur. He, did, he did never uh, went again to the church. Uh, and he said that it was the first time that he saw sincere davening. Sincere davening. And I wish you to find the same. A sincere davening to God. Was that Freudian when you said church? Uh, he, said he never again went to the church. Was that Freudian? No, he wanted to go to the church the next day to baptize himself. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got church. it. I got yeah. it. I got it. Last question for you, a very personal question. I find that your um, vocabulary is excellent. Are, are you satisfied with your English vocabulary? Uh, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I'm ashamed. You know, every time that... Um, Sometimes, like, I'm looking for a word, and they said, oh, a room did such a mistake. It took me, and <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed many, many times. You know, it's um, it's it's a terrible thing. And every time I think, oh, I have to, like, um, learn some more few words. So thank you for the compliment. But yeah, you, I, you know, you I, corrected the compliment me. compliment you... I, I can take about my English is that when I came here, a room I couldn't put one sentence together. You can, you can ask my friends from thirty years ago. They will tell you I could not put a sentence together, a simple one. Uh, I did learn in uh, yeshiva high school, but in Israel then English was kind of a joke. Like you had to say uh, good morning to the, and, and you you passed the test. Uh, when I came here, I couldn't speak English. And it gave me a great pleasure when I can read some of the books that we discussed. Some of them I read in Hebrew, some of them in English. And yeah, it's um, it's a good experience. But my English is still a source of embarrassment for myself. No, no, no. Before I said, I used the word metaphorical. And then you picked up on it and you said metaphoric. And I think you were correct. So, and English is my mother tongue. So I was very grateful that you corrected me. Quiet, there's silence. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really important that you subscribe to the show because subscription means that our numbers get higher. And when our numbers get higher, there's all kinds of doors that open up for us, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I would argue that probably uh, half the people who watch this show and my other podcasts uh, do so, but do not subscribe. So I would ask you, please, if you could just simply hit the the subscription button. Um, and again, that'll raise our numbers and you will help us out a lot. We can bring you more great podcasts. Uh, the podcast is sponsored by the Professional Center. Whether you need a private office away from distractions or a quiet place to meet, a client TPC has it all. They're Toronto's top co-working space at 120 Adelaide, where exceeding expectations is their standard. At TPC, they blend elegance with functionality, providing private office, fully equipped meeting rooms, and superior service with exceptional views. Choose TPC for more style, more space, more opportunity to succeed. For more information, visit theprofessionalcenter.com. And Rabbi, I'd like to conclude with a blessing for the hostages. May the one who blessed our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bless, preserve, and protect the captives and missing soldiers of the citizens of Israel and the Israel Defense Forces. May God rescue them from captivity and speedily restore them in peace in the merit of the prayers of this holy congregation who pray for them. May the Holy One, blessed be God, show them mercy, increase their strength, 
remove their pain and send them a recovery of body and spirit. May God return them to the bosom of their family swiftly and soon. And let us all say amen. Amen. Great job today, Rabbi. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this immensely. Thank you, Abram. Immensely. Uh, we wish everybody a wonderful day, and it's the month of El. So uh, dive into your tshuva. Ask forgiveness for those who you should be asking it from. There is a beautiful word from Rabbi, a rabbi, I can't remember whom, who says that there's this thought that the world was created for forgiveness. That the world was created for forgiveness. Think about that. Think about that thought and think about that individual out there. And I have one. I have this person that I have to apologize to. And it is the hardest thing in the world for me to do. But I have to do it before the high holidays start. And uh, and I will. And I will. Robbie, do you have to apologize to anybody? Uh, almost everyone I meet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but seriously, do you have someone in mind? Um, you know, I want to apologize to my family that, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, I don't spend enough time with him. Uh, I feel uh, horrible about it uh, many, many times. Um, not thinking enough, maybe my wife, who is working so hard uh, to put things together. Um, and as you say, sometimes the closest people um, are the people that we have to apologize to. Uh, you don't have to go to someone that you met once and maybe uh, like you uh, took his um, uh, line uh, to the to the cashier or something like this. Like the people who are close to us, many, many times we have to apologize to. That's the nature of relationship. And I'm so like taken by what you said, um, that the world was uh, created for forgiveness. It's very profound. And very very true i also want to add that this year like the last five years i am going to um conduct services in the forest earl bales forest i started a shul my own personal shul it's called the forest shul a number of years ago because i'm not a big fan of going to the, the traditional shuls uh on rosh hashanah yom kippur i just don't have patience for it so I established the Forest Shul. And we have about 35 people who go deep into Earl Bales with us. And uh, there is traditional song. There's traditional prayer, prayer. But there's a lot of meditation as well. At some point during the service, I ask people to find their own tree and to go over it. And to, if they want, they can hug it you know, as tree huggers. And to consider the energy that comes out of it in this beautiful creation of God. Um, they're very special. And you're certainly invited to come. Just be in touch with me at avram.rosenswag at gmail.com. Where are you going for uh, high holidays, Rabbi? Wow. Uh, you know what? When I have to meditate sometimes for myself to find some peace, I always think about a certain place uh, that I was in about 30 years ago. It was indeed uh, a forest somewhere around Halliburton, in uh, Ontario. Like It was a rare moment of peaceful tranquility and in the middle of nature and i thought about the trees around me you know they all like growing up and up and like their branches are like hands of a person like towards god and until this very day this is a very very strong memory so when i have to uh sometimes you know to relax or something like this i think about this very moment Lovely. so i'm not going to join you this year no. room, but um I wish everyone who comes to your minyan to feel the unity of human and nature and God together. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, have a beautiful week, a beautiful Elul. Am Yisrael Achai. Proud to be a Jew. Proud to be a Jew. And this is all part of it, what we are doing here, right? Proud to be a Jew. Until then, we say in the vernacular, we talked about Yiddish before, Zai Gesund, be healthy and be productive and find your, find your purpose and meaning. Thank you so much for joining us.